Hi, good afternoon. I like to welcome you to Poem Praise 2. I do thank you for tuning in and peace and blessings be upon you and your family this afternoon. Now we are going to get right back into African American poetry. Right now, this is the introduction. This is going to be take two of the introduction. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. It goes like this. Brooks combined a deep love of black people, especially those who lived in her native Chicago, with an interest in modernism, an approach to writing that often involves the use of complex, challenging language. She could write with pure simplicity, as in Pete at the Zoo, page 30. But elsewhere, her meaning is somewhat harder to grasp. In The Bean Eaters, page 31, for example, what is her attitude to the culpa in the poem? Hmm. Does she admire them? Hmm. Or is she merely observing them with pity in their old age and poverty? Hmm. In later years, starting in the 1960, Black American poultry, poetry, excuse me, and culture further changed. Younger poets set about expressing themselves with a the freedom never before seen in African American poetry. Not even during the Harlem Renaissance. Most of them wrote with a sense of pride and determination that would have astonished their ancestors. Their boldness was encouraged by the U.S. Supreme Court decision of 1954 that struck down school segregation and by the civil rights struggle led by Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. around 1965. A whole new group of poets emerged after the sudden rise of the idea of black power, which often emphasized the need for African Americans to separate themselves from the white community in the 1960s and 1970s. Poetry became more popular than ever before. Many of the new writers wrote works that mainly express anger and even rage at racial pre prejudice. This powerful energy broke down certain older ways of writing poems. Black poetry moved increasingly toward free verse with little or no interest in rhyme, traditional punctuation, and other forms that restricted the poet. Eventually, anger and rage gave way to quieter but no less effective approaches. These changes are well represented in the poems chosen here from writers such as Alice Walker, Lucille Clifton, Naomi Long Madgett, Carolyn M. Rogers, June Jordan, and Nikki Giovanni. Among writers who established themselves in the 1960s, and Michael S. Weaver, now known as Alpha Michael Weaver, and Elizabeth Alexander, who came later. In the nature of this flower is to bloom, page 33. For example, Alice Walker writes of revolutionary petunias. Revolutions, the overthrowing of governments, usually by people who have been opposed by them. Oppressed, not opposed, excuse me on that, by them. Often mm -hmm. come about through violence. But in this poem, revolution is represented by the refusal of certain common flowers to wither and die in the face of the strong forces all around it. Is Walker asking us to see ordinary black people as tough but beautiful flowers that stand their ground against the world. When Melvin Dixon writes in Obsidian, I'm going to spell it for you, O-B-S 
I-D-I-A-N, page 45, about an unusually hard form of black glass created by volcanoes. Does he want to remind us of the African-American people? When June Jordan tells us in Plum Blossom, Plum Jam, page 43, about a tree that seems dead, but then almost miraculously blooms and bears delicious fruit. Is she also telling us something about black people? Or does she mean for us to read in her poem a statement about human beings everywhere? Is poem number one, page 37, by Carolyn M. Rogers about African Americans only are about the world in general. The sample questions might be asked of Maya Angelou in her poem, Caged Bird, page 42. Sometimes black poets go even further in detaching themselves from race as a subject. In Winter Poem, page 35, for example, Nikki Giovanni enters into a fantasy about being completely at one with nature in the snow and then in the spring rain that follows. Note how the absence of any punctuation in the poem enhances our sense of the poet's pure happiness. In Offspring, page 44, Naomi, Naomi excuse me, Long Maggot sees her plans and dreams about her daughter give way to the girl's own ideas about what she wants to do with her life. In the end, the poet is proud of her child's independence and mature judgment. And parents everywhere have been taught a lesson, perhaps about trusting their children. In The Poet, page 40. Lucille Clifton reveals the extent to which she sees poetry as coming from troubling forces in her mind that cannot be denied. Isn't there a lesson here for everyone? Hmm. Carolyn M. Rogers, around page 36, has a similar theme to which many people can relate. Often, one must struggle to understand life. There is usually no shortcut to getting to the heart of a serious matter. If these and other African American poets frequently write without reference to race, just as often the past of slavery and segregation and the pain of life under injustice continue to be features of black poetry. When Alpha Michael Weaver writes in My Father's First Baseball Game, page 38, about attending the event with his father, the sad past is upon us. His father cannot forget the days when black people were not allowed to play in the major leagues and often were not even allowed to sit among white people in the stands. Similarly, in Apollo, page 46. Elizabeth Alexander cannot write about watching the first man land on the moon in 1969 without setting that historic moment against the discomfort of her family seeing the event on television in a roadside restaurant where they know they are perhaps not wanted as customers because of their skin color. Thus, we see African-American poets continuing to follow the trail first blazed by Phyllis Wheatley. As a girl in Boston more than two centuries ago, she wanted to write both about herself as a person of African descent who experienced hardships in America and about herself as a human being who loved poetry and the world around her. She wanted to write about the present and the past, sadness and joy, black and white, men and women, herself and others. Above all, she wanted to be a poet.
For more than 200 years, Afri African American poets have accepted the same responsibilities she did, sought the same freedom to express themselves, and often worked against severe odds to do so. In the process, these writers have created a precious, powerful, and ever-evolving body of work. Arnold Remersad, Stanford University. Now this does complete the introduction. Stay tuned for our poems that we are going to be going through. The first one is going to be on page 8, which we are going to be on. On being brought from Africa to America by Phil Phyllis Wheatley, 1753-1784. And on that note, I want you and your family to be blessed. Have a wonderful rest of the afternoon. And until I speak with you again, I want you to be well, take care, and until next time, later y'all.